using me because I learned how to bow down in the presence of the master and if you humble yourself up under the mighty hand of God at the right time in due season at the set time God will raise you up since in my spirit a set time of favor has come you know when I was on the street Anybody that didn't take the oath and became a made guy, like I was in that family, anybody that wasn't a made guy, we called him a sucker. He could have been a Catholic priest, he could have been the President of the United States. If he wasn't one of us, he was a sucker. And of course, that was wrong. It wasn't the right way to look at people, but that was our attitude. But I will tell you this, in life, if you're not educated, if you don't know what's happening around you, then you do, do become a sucker to other people that know more than you. It's important that you're educated, not only in the Lord, but it's important that you're educated in what's going on in the world around you, people. Very important. So I support what Pastor Jason is, is doing here at the church. I've offered my services. I'm a neighbor of yours. I don't live too far away. And any time I can be of assistance or help in that regard, I'm here. And you have my full attention, brother. And. Um, you know, I just, um, I was blessed to be in Singapore for the past two weeks. I went over there actually on a secular event that I had in a, um, it was kind of a business forum that I went and I was the keynote speaker at. While I was there, a young pastor uh, found out that I was in town. He invited me to his church. I was able to share my story. A number of people came to Christ in Singapore. And uh, then I was introduced to a pastor there, associate pastor, who has one of the biggest churches on the island. And they're bringing me back in February to do a little bit more. So, again, I went there for a secular purpose, but God had his hand out over there. And um, it goes to show you, people, how God works, how his network of people work. And I was so blessed to have been there. Uh, today is my daughter's 16th um, birthday. We're having a sweet 16 party at my house. And um, uh, they're transforming my backyard into an old Hollywood studio, and all I can say is I thank Pastor Jason for having me here, because I'd have my sleeves rolled up and I'd be working pretty hard at home, and I got out of it, so thank you, Pastor. But um, as soon as I get home, it'll be ready. So again, I really appreciate it. And you know, the challenge that I have here, I have 30 minutes to speak. And I want to tell you this, when I come up here, I take ministry very, very serious, people. I'm not here to entertain you, okay, and I'm not here to turn you into a Christian. I'm not here to impose my faith on you. I'm here to share what the Lord has done in my life. And I believe that's the obligation that all of us have. Remember, the last message or the last order that Jesus gave to his disciples was to go out and preach the good word to all of creation. And every one of us have an obligation to do that. Amen? And my prayer is always, Lord, let me be effective. Let me be passionate enough in delivering this message so that you can reach out and touch the heart that you want to touch in this room. It might be one person, it might be ten, might be everybody in the room. I don't know and I don't worry about that. That's God's deal. My only prayer is, Lord, let me be effective. Let the Holy Spirit come down and give me the right words to say. And that's what I pray for in this next 30 minutes. Now, how many of you new visitors, first time here? Okay, we have a few. All right, you, amen. Now, I'll tell you this, I don't know what brought you into this church today. Okay, it might be the first time you come in. Maybe you heard a mob guy was going to be here. You say, hey, Sopranos is off the air. Let me we'll see what the real mob guy is all about, right? It's okay. doesn't matter. But if you're in this church this morning, then God wants to plant a seed in your heart. And he will, no doubt. Some of you are going to be impacted right away. I'm going to walk outside. Some of you are going to come over to me like you did in the first service, and you say, Mike, I was the one person that God really needed to have here this morning. You touched my heart with the message. Great. Some of you are going to walk out of here and say, ah, I heard something like that before, and you're going to go about your business. I will tell you this. It might take 20 years before the, the Lord waters the seed that's planted in your heart this morning, but I'm going to tell you this, people. Once God's got a hold of your heart, he will never let you go. So you may as well jump on board today because God's going to get you in his time eventually. And um, people, I want you to take a really good look at me in all seriousness today. I'm probably the most blessed, most fortunate person that's ever going to get up on this stage and address you about anything. And the reason I say this, you saw a glimpse of it in that video. If I'd have been left up to my own path in life, the choice that I wanted to make, stay on the path that I was on, 
I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. And quite honestly, that's what I deserved. I earned that, having spent over 20 years on the street every day, and I mean every day, in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. I lived a life of sin, and there's no other way to sugarcoat that or get around it. And what I did, I did consciously, people. Now, I know some of you out here have struggled with drug addiction. Some of you may have a gambling problem. Some of you may have other things in your life. And I want to tell you that I don't excuse it. You want to talk about drugs? I know everything there is to know about drugs. I never got involved in it. But I saw a lot of it on the street. I had a sister that died of an overdose of drugs at the age of 27. My brother, kid brother, 25 years in a drug, as a drug addict. Right now, he's in the witness protection program. Got himself in trouble on the street became a, an informant for the government and ended up testifying against my father and put my father back in jail. That's what drugs do to you. I don't excuse it, but I understand when you're under that influence, you do things you wouldn't normally do. Well, I don't have that issue in my life. What I did, I did knowingly and willingly. And the reason I believe I'm here this morning is to be an encouragement to all of you that are struggling, and I know some of you are. Some of you look to the left and the right and you say, you know what? Why does that person have it all together and I got to go through what I'm going through in my life? Let me tell you a little secret. Everybody's got something they're dealing with in their life. Robin Williams, two years ago, was worth $160 million. Last year, he filed for bankruptcy. A few days ago, he committed suicide. Don't think that because you have money and power and prestige in this life that that solves the problems. It doesn't all the time. Everybody is dealing with something, people. And the reason I want to be an encouragement to all of you is this. If God can forgive me, and I believe he has, and there's no arrogance in that, people. I struggled with forgiveness mightily. You don't do the things that I did in my life and just think that you snap your fingers and you're going to be forgiven, even though, you know what, when God knows your heart, that's the deal when you are sorry for your sins. But if God can forgive me, and not only forgive me, but give me my life, give me my freedom, a wife that I adore, children that I love, a ministry that I never asked for. I didn't ask for this. I ran from it. God kept pulling me back. If he can do this for me, then he can and he will do it for every one of you sitting in here in this room this morning. So what Pastor Jason and I want to do for you this morning is we want you to walk out here differently than when you walked in. We want to release the enemy's hold on your mind that is separating you from the power of God, separating you from what God can do in your life if you allow him to. And that's what we hope to accomplish here. In the next 15 or 20 minutes, we ask the Holy Spirit to put the right words to get into your head, into your heart, so that that may happen for you and you walk out of here renewed different person walking with the Lord. And I'm here really for one reason, and that reason is to give praise and honor and glory to my Savior and my hero in life, Jesus Christ. And that's what you're going to hear. Now I'll tell you a little bit about my story. My dad was the underboss of the Colombo family, one of the five New York La Cosa Nostra uh, mafia families. Very powerful position. My dad was very, very high profile. I kind of grew up in a life, I grew up differently than most of you in here, I would hope. I grew up hating the police. I hated law enforcement. I hated the government. And not because dad taught me that way. He was smart, taught me to respect the law, but it was really because of what I witnessed. They were all over my dad all the time, all over my family. I loved my dad. He was my hero in life. And I looked at them as my enemy, trying to harass my dad, hurt my family. And I hated them growing up. Now, I got to tell you this, I don't feel that way anymore. People, it's amazing how God can not only transform your heart, and I think you know he can, but how he can transform your mind. How this whole distorted sense of view I had growing up where good was bad and bad was good, God's been able to fix that today. Some of my dearest friends are in law enforcement. And not because I share information. I don't do that. We're just friends. Many of us are brothers and sisters in Christ all across this country. And I do want to say this. I didn't mention it in the first service. But I know some of you have had some gang issues here. I speak with gangbangers all the time. I go into high schools. I work with sheriff's departments. We talk to these young people. And we tell them straight out and listen to this. I have experience. You do not get away with criminal conduct in America anymore. Forget about it. Law enforcement is too sophisticated, too many weapons. You go that route, you're going down. And I want to tell you this, people. 
The most powerful message you can give our young people today is this. It applies to all of us, but especially to our young people. Remember this. You are who you hang with in this world. You hang with the wrong crowd. I don't care if you dress up nice, have great parents, go to a great school, drive a good car. You hang with the wrong people. You're going to be known to be the wrong kind of person. You must surround yourself with good people in life. I want to tell you this. When I came to Christ, I didn't get a lobotomy. I don't forget the 20 years I had on the street. I know every trick there is in the book. I can do a lot of things the wrong way. And you know what? I stay away from a lot of business because I'm tempted to do things that I shouldn't be doing because I know all the tricks. So I stay away from it. You must surround yourself with good people. If I wasn't fortunate and blessed enough to have people around me that cared about me and kept me in the right direction, I might have slipped back. And I want to tell you this, especially you first-timers that are coming to church. Today you're a first-timer. Tomorrow don't become a last-timer. You must come to church. You must surround yourself with good people. I've heard people say to me, you know what, Mike, I don't need to go to church. Church is in my house. Church is not in your house. Church is in church. Church is where you come to hear this wonderful worship music and give praise and honor and glory to our Lord and Savior. Church is where you come around like-minded people that love the Lord and fill you with the Spirit and you have great fellowship. Church is where you come to hear a great pastor deliver a great message that prepares you for what you're going to deal with throughout the week. Church is in church, people, and it's important that you come here and you come to the right church, and I think you're in the right one right now. Amen? Dad went away. He drew a 50-year prison sentence. He originally didn't want this life for me. He wanted me to go to school and be a doctor. Drew a 50-year prison sentence for, I will tell you this, a crime that he did not commit. My dad was innocent and did 35 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. But you know what? It only shows you one thing. You put your hand in the fire long enough, you're going to get burnt. You put a bullseye on your back, they're going to catch up with you. The system is not always fair, people. That's why you avoid it, you stay away from it, you do the right things in life. You don't put extra baggage on your shoulders. When dad went away, I was devastated. Joe Colombo, the boss of my family, kind of took me under his wing. I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends. They influenced me. Mike, if you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison. I go see him in Leavenworth Penitentiary. Dad, I'm not going to school anymore. If I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. He was upset. We argued a little bit. He knew my mind was made up. He said, okay, son. But if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. In his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. He said, go home. Somebody's going to be in touch with you. Do whatever you're told. And dad asked me one question. And again, the first time I ever said this was this morning in this service, and I don't know why, but maybe it's to inspire you, to make you understand that no matter what you've done in your life, God is ready to forgive you if you're sincerely sorry. He asked me one question. He said, Mike, if you ever had to kill anybody, could you do it? Surprise me. Never asked a question like that before. And this is my father. I thought about it a minute. I really gave it some thought, and I said, you know what, Dad? Under the right circumstances, I believe I can do it. That was his test. He said, Mike, that's the right answer. Go home. I'm going to send word downtown. You do whatever you're told. That's all he prepared me for. He didn't say another word. He didn't tell me this is what's required of you. This is what you have to do. Go home and do what you're told. And I want to tell you this. Most of you have experienced this, I believe, in this room. Some of you haven't, but I want to tell you this. When you finally come to Christ and you get this relationship with Jesus. And again, if I wasn't giving my testimony and I had more time, I'd speak to you all day about a relationship with Jesus because that's what this life is all about. First and foremost, a relationship with our King, with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You're going to look back in your life and you're going to say, you know what, God, now I get it. Now I know why you put the person in my life. Now I know why you gave me this great joy, why you allowed me not cause me, people, allowed me to go through this struggle. You're using all of these circumstances in my life, Lord, to prepare me for what my purpose is later on. And I want you to think about it. All of you that have struggled, drug addiction, broken homes, gangbangers, whatever it is, God can use all those circumstances in your life to prepare you for what his purpose is later on. And even the sinful experiences, and you say, oh, wait a minute, Mike. God doesn't use sin. Well, let me ask you this. If God didn't use sinful people and sinful experiences to fill his purpose, 
who would he have to use? The answer is nobody. And the reason I say that is don't allow your downfalls in life, your sinful experiences to be a deterrent for what God can use them for later on. Remember what the enemy meant for bad, God will turn around and use for his glory. Amen? And this meeting was very important for two reasons. Number one, my dad was proposing me into a criminal lifestyle that would forever alter my life. But number two, because when dad said to me, go home and do what you're told, and I didn't question him, I had blind faith in what my father told me to do. And people say that Christians are supposed to have blind faith. Don't challenge God. Don't ever challenge the Bible. God will get mad at you. He's God. He'll get angry. Well, I want to tell you this. When I came to Christ, I challenged God. And it was because of this experience that I had, I said, God, wait a second. I trusted my father more than anything in my life. I loved this man. I idolized him. I followed him blindly, and look where it got me, and it got me in a bad place. You take it a second step in my life. I took a blood oath on Halloween night, 1975, with five other gentlemen. I walked into a room, and I took a blood oath. I surrendered my life to La Cosa Nostra, the mafia. And people, when you come into that life, you've got to give it all up, body, mind, and soul. It overcomes you. And if you don't do that, you don't survive in that life. It's a treacherous life. I said, Lord, I did this twice in my life. And now people are telling me that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That this Bible is the blueprint for my life. Written by men, but inspired by you. But you know what, God? You're asking a lot of me. Yeah, that's right, God. You put me on this earth. You gave me a free will. You said I can have one of any hundred faiths, or I don't have to have any faith at all, but you're telling me the only way to do it, the only way to seek eternal life and to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. It's black and white, no gray area. I said, well, you know what, God? If that's the case, I trusted my father. I trusted in La Cosa Nostra. Look where I am now, and it was a bad place. I said, you're going to have to prove it to me. You're going to have to show me the evidence. And people, I know a little bit about evidence. I've been to trial five times. I've been to more grand juries than there are people in this section of the room. Evidence has been a major part of my life. I will tell you this. I'm a pretty cynical guy. You grow up on the street, you get cynical. You're not selling me the Brooklyn Bridge. You're not getting things passed to me when my antenna is up because I'm watching all the time. And I will tell you this. When I finally opened up this stubborn mind and this heart and said, okay, God, show me. He didn't get mad at me. He didn't get angry. You know what he said? I believe he said, okay, finally, you're ready to open your heart and your mind. You're not what challenging me. I'm God, and I got the proof. And if you're ready to listen, I'm ready to give it to you. And people, I want to tell you this, especially you guys out there, you hard-headed guys. My brother-in-law and I, we speak to men all the time. You know, and they're like, oh, show me, show me, you know? And then they don't want to look. You got to do the work. It's like anything else. Education, like Jason was telling you. You got to even be educated in your faith, people. God wants you educated in your faith. He wants you to see the evidence. He wants you to seek him because the further you seek, the more you're going to find the reality of the one true God. And when I did my work and I saw, I found out this, there is more evidence, more rock-solid, hard evidence to prove that the Bible is truly God's Word and that Jesus is our risen Savior, because I'm not putting my faith in anybody that's dead and buried in a tomb. I learned long ago, dead people don't help you. There's more evidence to prove that than there is anything else that exists in this world, people. And if you give yourself the opportunity to prove it, you'll walk away with the same amount of faith that I have. And my faith is strong. Doesn't make me a better person, just makes me strong in my faith. And I want to tell you this, I've been challenged on that, and I want to teach you something now, and I want you to really, really listen. I've been challenged about that. Some educated guys came up to me and said, Mike, that all sounds good. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? Have you ever seen God? No, I have not. Has he ever spoken to you? Spoken to my heart? But I've never heard him speak audibly. I've never seen him in a dream. I don't have that gift. Some people might. I don't have it. But he speaks to my heart through, through all the time now because I have a relationship with him. But no, okay, I've never seen him. I've never seen heaven. Nobody's come back to me. I don't know. But let me tell you this. Here's how I know. From the time I was five years old, my father put it into my head, Michael, the standard that you have to live up to in life is this. You have to be a man's man. That's it. You got to make people respect you. You got to walk around with your head, head held high. 
You gotta have integrity. Treat women the right way. Treat children the right way. Give everybody respect and in turn they'll respect you. That's a man's man. And I like that. That was good counsel. When I got into the life, that's all I ever heard every day. We're men of honor. We're men of respect. And like Jason said, I looked up to some of the guys that I thought were men's men. I looked up to Fat Tony Salerno. He was the boss of the Genovese family. You saw him on the cover of the magazine. He had integrity. People respected him. He had power. I looked up to Pauli Castellano before he got killed. He had integrity too. My father, Sonny Francis. These are the guys that I wanted to emulate in my life. So when I finally did come to Christ, I did it a little differently than most of you would do in this room, but I, I encourage you to do it. Separate his deity from his manhood and study Jesus the man as it's written in the New Testament. Because I will tell you this, when you focus on the manhood of Jesus the way I did, and you have that standard in your head, what a true man's man should be, you will walk away saying this, Jesus Christ was the only true man's man that ever walked the face of the earth. There was nobody like him. There will never be anybody like him ever again. He is the only man's man that ever walked the face of the earth, perfect in every way. And you can't say that about anybody else. And I was so blown away. Read the New Testament and study Jesus the man. Study the wisdom that came out of his mouth. Study the way he treated women when they were sixth class citizens. Study how he treated children. Think of the wisdom that he, he, he put upon his people at that time. The parables that he used to teach were brilliant. In every sense of the word, brilliant. And you know what impressed me so much? Maybe because of my background, I don't know. But I was around hypocrisy my whole life. I was a hypocrite at one point in time, being part of that life. But I remember... And it really made an impression on me when Jesus was standing in front of the Pharisees and they were trying to tell him something. And he looked at them straight in the eye and he had no army behind him. This was the power of the land at that point in time. And he looked at them straight in the eye knowing that they were misleading the people for their own benefit. And what did he call, do? He called them out. He said, hypocrites, right to their face. That was bold. You don't understand how meaningful that was back then. And how about when he stood in front of Pilate Knowing that he was innocent, kept his mouth shut, didn't even defend himself because his father commissioned him to do a job. And he said, you know what? Innocent or not, I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to do what my father told me to do. And then how that man took the punishment, horrible punishment. And remember, he was a man. Remember in the Garden of Eden, prayed, sweat blood, looked up at his father and said, Father, if you can, pass this chalice from me tonight. But then he said what? Not your will, not my will, but yours. And went on to do the job that his father commissioned to do, knowing that he was going to suffer a horrible death. There is no man on the face of the earth that would do that, people. Remember that. So here's the deal. I don't care what faith you are. You want to be a man's man, and ladies, this is what you should want your man to be. You want to be a man's man, you emulate Jesus throughout your life. Because you know why? Everybody around you will benefit. You'll become a better husband. You can't help it. You'll become a better father. If you're a boss, you'll treat your employees better. If you're an employee, you'll give your boss an honest day's pay. You'll treat everybody in the community the way they're supposed to be treated. Everyone around you throughout your life will benefit, and you will benefit throughout your life from emulating the greatest man that ever walked the face of the earth. And. And listen to this, and this is the argument you can raise. If you're wrong by some slim, slim chance, when you're dead, you're dead anyway. But throughout your life, you benefited yourself and everybody around you. So it's a win-win situation. But you know this, people. We are right because the evidence is strong. And trying to emulate Jesus and having this relationship with him will guarantee you your place in heaven for all of eternity. And you know what? I'll tell you this. You know what your goal in life is? Your goal is to get to heaven. When you cut to the chase, as we said on the street, it's to get to heaven. And according to your purpose in life that God has given you, you bring as many people with you as you can, but your purpose is to get to heaven. And the way to do that is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So go for it, people. And I'll tell you this. 
Jason mentioned the devil, and I'm proud of him for doing that because I go to churches all the time. They don't want to mention the devil because people won't walk in the door. They don't want to hear the bad news. Well, you know what? It is bad news because hell is a real place. It's mentioned in the Bible several times. Jesus talked about it. But the good news is none of us got to go there. So what are we afraid of? I tell my kids, the devil isn't standing in the closet with a pitchfork and horns on his head. Doesn't do that. He can only do one thing. He doesn't put you in a car and make you have an accident. He might put the drug in your head and in your body that causes you to lose your mind and do things like that because you're separated from God. He can do only one thing, and that's separate you from the power of God. That's his mission on earth, to mock God, to separate God's people, and to let them go in the wrong direction. But you can conquer that. You're conquering it right now by being in this church. You can conquer that by having a relationship with God. Now, I got five minutes left, and I want to relay something to you. God prepares us throughout our life for what he's going to do for us later on. And I'll tell you one of the incidents in my life that prepared me for where I am now. My dad is on parole. He gives me a call one day. There was a lot of talk on the street. I was bringing in a lot of money. The boss of my family starting to get a little worried, a little jealous. My dad and I were really accumulating a lot of power. The bosses of the other family liked me a lot. I was spreading the wealth around, and people within my family were getting nervous, the boss especially. My dad calls me one day. He says, Mike, come to see me. I go to his house. He says, look, the boss, Junior Persico, he wants to see us tonight. I said, okay, Dad. What time do you want me to pick you up? I always drove him everywhere. We were both captains, couple of regimes at that time. He said, Mike, they want to do this differently. They want me to come in first, you to come in second. I said, Dad, what do you mean? No, if we go, we go together because people, I want to tell you this, one of the horrors of that life, you make a mistake, you might be in trouble, you don't really know about it because your best friend puts his arm around you and says, hey, Mike, we got to go to a meeting. You walk in the door, you don't walk out again. That's the way things are done in that life quite often, and unfortunately, I witnessed that a number of times. We're in the driveway. I said, Dad, no, we're not doing that. You know the talk on the street. Why would we allow them to separate us? If we're going to go, we go together. No, son, we got an order. Back and forth, back and forth. My dad always played by the book. Finally, I threw my hands up. I said, okay, Dad, I don't like it. But if this is what you want, I've been listening to you all my life, I'll do it again. He leaves. I mean, I leave. I get a call from Jimmy Angelina, another captain in a family, a guy I knew all my life. He says, Mike, meet me on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn. I'll drive you to the meeting. I meet him at 1130 at night, drop off my car, get in the car with him. There's a guy sitting behind me. I'm in the passenger seat. I don't like the setup. Jimmy, who's usually really talkative, we got along great. We knew each other 25 years. He says to me, <clears throat> he doesn't say anything to me. He starts talking to me about the Yankees. Now, I'm a diehard Yankee fan. I didn't want to hear about the Yankees. I wanted to be prepared for what was going on. He doesn't say a word. People, we parked that car, and I want to tell you this, and I'm not lying. It was a 30-yard walk from the car to the basement of that house. When I get out of that car, that was either the longest or the shortest walk of my life. Jimmy files in behind me, the kid in the back behind him. As I'm walking, I'm saying to myself, this is it. I put myself in a trap. As I'm walking that 30 yards into that basement, I can tell you this, until today, when I talk about it, I can smell the flowers. I can hear the crickets chirping. That's how real it became to me. I found out this, when you're going to meet your maker, your senses do become heightened. My knees were weak. My heart was pounding out of my chest, and I started praying. I wasn't a religious guy at all at that point in time, but I started praying. When you're going to meet your maker, you pray. I don't care where you are. And I'm walking into that room, and I don't know if I'm going to get it in the back of the head. And people say to me, Michael, what courage you had. It wasn't courage. It was robotic. I don't know why I didn't cut and run. I just said, hey, if this is it, this is it. The door opens up. Obviously, I'm here. We sit down with the boss. We go back and forth. It was over money. No problem. I started to get angry with the boss. You don't do that in that life. It's dangerous. Caught myself, answered all the questions, said, Jimmy, do me a favor. Drive me home. I got a long ride. We get in the car. I turn to Jimmy. I'm just about to blast him for not preparing me for what the meeting was all about. He goes to me, hey, stop. 
before you say anything, let me ask you this. If this were the other way around and I was in the passenger seat and you were driving me in, would you have warned me about anything? Because he didn't know what was going to happen that night. And I looked at him and I said, no. He said, well, that's the life we lead, Mike. You know it better than anybody. You grew up in this. And it really got me. I said, man, what kind of life is this? We lead our own friends possibly into their death. As I'm getting out of the car, he grabbed my arm and he said something to me that till this moment I'll never forget. He said, Mike, I want to tell you something. You're not going to want to hear this, but you can take it to the bank. It's true. I said, what? He said, your father was in there before you tonight. He didn't help you one bit. He hurt you. You were on your own in there tonight. And I found out later my father did hurt me in that room. Cut two, two years later. I didn't do anything. I filed it away because you don't say things in that life. You got to be very careful how you talk. You talk to the wrong person, gets back to the wrong person, you're in trouble. You got to learn how to keep your mouth shut. I filed it away. Two years later, I meet a young lady, and I want to tell you this. I'm not the story. You're going to be proud of this. There was a young lady in my life now who brought me to Christ, young Christian girl. Her name was Cami Garcia, my brother-in-law's sister. You know where she grew up? Norwalk, California. And I want to tell you this. A few years ago, Vanity Fair magazine wrote a big story about me and her. They had a picture of her. And underneath the picture, they had the caption that said, the woman that changed the face of organized crime in America because she led me to the Lord and out of that life I was going to take over the family. She came right here from Norwalk, California. She was 20 years old. I fell very much in love with her. And through her and her mother, who is no longer with us, Irma Garcia, who I love, who is the most godly woman I ever met in my life, God had a different plan and a purpose. And through these two women, he led me out of that life and into where I am today. Now, I want to tell you how, how meaningful that is, people. When you walk away from that life, okay, you don't just walk away. There's a death sentence on you. And I knew when I walked away I was going to have trouble. But you know what? God prepared me in that meeting two years earlier. He showed me that, number one, I could face death. He showed me, number two, that the person that I loved and trusted the most, my father, could let me down. And remember this always let you down. We're imperfect. And one thing I want to caution you all about, because I've heard this so many times before from people who said, you know, I don't want to go into that church. They don't treat me right. And as a result, God is a phony. God's not real. Let me tell you this, people. Don't ever make the mistake of judging a perfect God by his imperfect people. Don't ever do that. People will let you down, not meaningful. I tell my kids, I may let you down, not because I don't love you, because I'm imperfect. I can't always be what you want me to be. But God will never let you down. Even when you think you're being let down, he's got your back and he's behind you and he'll get you through every struggle. Now I'm going to wrap it up by telling you this. On Halloween night, 1975, I walked into a room. There were six of us that night. That was 39 years ago. We all took an oath and became sworn, made members of the Colombo family. I had a contract on my life for many years. It's still alive today. Out of the six of us that walked into that room, I'm the only one alive. Not one of those five gentlemen died of natural causes. Every one of them died in a horrible way. You saw the Fortune magazine article written in 1986, the 50 most powerful mob bosses in the country. They had a chart with the 50 of us on there. I was number 18, the youngest guy on the list, five behind Gotti at that time. And I said, don't ask me how they make a list like that. They didn't ask for my tax returns. All nonsense, sold a lot of magazines, not important. But what is important is this. In 1995, when I walked away, everybody predicted my death. I didn't know if I was gonna survive. But out of that list of 50, some 30 years later, 44 of those men are dead. Three of them are doing life in prison without parole, and I'm here to give praise and honor and glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the reason is because God had a different plan and a purpose for my life, and when God's got a purpose for your life, no mafia, no sickness, no death, no drug addiction, no gambling problem, no gang will interfere with that. The only person in your life 
that can stop God from fulfilling his purpose in your life is you. Remember this, people. Our God is never an intruder. He's always an invited guest. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make you the proverbial offer that you shouldn't refuse because you need to let today be the first day of the rest of your life. If you're not walking with the Lord today, you're cheating yourself. You're stopping God from doing a work in your life, whether it be today, tomorrow, or next week. You're stopping God from fulfilling the purpose in this life that you were born to fulfill. Our God never takes a day off. He's never on vacation. He's always here. When God is not working in your life, it's your fault, not his. He doesn't go to the next church. He doesn't go to the next person. He doesn't leave us to go to another country. He's always here trying to get your attention. The answer is, are you paying attention? If you're in this church now, God wants to touch your heart. And I want to tell you this. I travel this country quite a bit, people. I see people struggling all the time. They contact me on Facebook and all these social media networks and all of that. People contact me. People are really struggling in this world. And you know why? Because they're not standing up bold for Jesus the way he will stand up for them. And today, more than ever, you see what's going on in the world. And if you don't, get educated. Like Jason says, it's important to know what's going on in this world. Christianity is on the run in many places. It's important for us to stand boldly for Jesus, to be able to proclaim right out in the open that we are soldiers in the army of Jesus Christ. I'm proud to do that. Nobody's going to shut me up as long as I have a breath to take. Nobody's going to shut Jason up. I can see it. And nobody should shut any one of you up. But if you want Jesus to have your back, then you've got to have his starting today. Hi everyone, thank you for watching us online today. We hope that this message has impacted you in a powerful way, and if it has, we would love to hear about it. Just email us at mystory@gotofreedom.org and share with us everything that God is doing in your life and how freedom has been a part of it. If you would like to support the vision financially, you can by clicking on the giving tab on the homepage of our website. We'll see you next week for another dynamic teaching by Pastor Jason. Thank you and have a great day.